Hello, everybody. I'm Bernard Kavinsky. I'm going to provide you with an update on my model railroad, the U.S. Military Acquire Line. And we'll start with this little video clip showing a scene on my railroad. And uh, notice the flags flying in the breeze there. One of the things about railroads in my era, which is a, a red flag does not mean the same thing that a red flag means today. And so one of the things I'll be talking about is how railroads were different back then compared to today. So the outline that I'm gonna follow, and by the way, can everybody hear me okay? Just nod your heads or whoever's, whoever's not watching. Everybody hears okay, good. Yes, you're All right, fine. so here we go. Background, um, before we get into the railroads, since some of you may or may not be that familiar with the Civil War railroads, I'm gonna do a little bit of background, but I'm gonna go really fast through that. That's a different talk. I've done that talk uh, twice this month already, once to the Barringer Library, and, and last week I did it to the Cincinnati uh, MEO, N, no, NMRA. Once we get through that, uh, we'll move to my line. I'll talk about some of the challenges of modeling this railroad and O-scale and some of the methods I used to get there. And I'll show you some pictures of where I stand and then talk about what's gonna happen in the future, I hope. So first question you might ask is, why would you wanna model the Civil War? You know, I was born in New York and up there, a Civil War was an ancient memory. And my dad did build us a train layout when we were kids. So in that picture, you see my twin brother and I playing with our trains. My brother had a Santa Fe diesel and I had the steam engine. And whoever said that model railroading is not a chick magnet, well, they're wrong. And there's a proof because I have no idea who that girl is next to our layout, but she wanted to come over and see our trains. So Civil War was an ancient memory. We were uh, really in New York when we did history like that, we looked at the Revolution War. But when you moved down to Virginia, which I did over 30 years ago, you were surrounded by Civil War history. The first casualties of the Civil War happened at the Marshall House, which is less than two miles from where I live. And so I got interested in the Civil War and I, I did some war gaming on the Civil War. And I also did a lot of military modeling in the 135th scale or 132nd scale. And I scratch built some things and I've always been interested in military modeling because uh, I served in the military and uh, was interested in military history. So it was a natural fit that Civil War railroading would combine those two interests. And you'll find if you delve into it that Civil War railroads have a lot going for them. Uh, this is the early stage of timetable and train order. And I like timetable and train order operations. It's a little more cerebral. So you have to think about what's going on. But it's not too complicated that even a first timer on my railroad will probably figure it out pretty quick. Uh, the schedules are pretty busy because there were no trucks. Everything was either human powered or animal powered or steam powered on the rails. So lots of rail traffic. Uh, the engines themselves are very colorful and they also have names and personalities. So, you know, all the engines on my railroad have names, they're not numbered. And the equipment itself is smaller back then, so you can model in a larger scale. And in this picture, we see O-scale locomotive, an HO-8, and then next to it is an N-scale SD-50. So you can see that a O-scale Civil War era 440 locomotive is about the same size as an HO diesel. And then the Civil War was really the first railroad war. There were other military engagements that used railroads, but the Civil War, American Civil War, was the first war where the railroads shaped strategy and affected the outcomes of many of the battles. So before we get too far into the train stuff, let's just do a little review of what was going on at the time of the Civil War. And what's interesting is this is a quote that Sherman said, it's not in his memoirs, but it's alleged to have said this at a dinner he was having at a Louisiana military academy, which he helped found before the war started. And if you read this, you'll see he basically predicted the outcome of the war. So what was Sherman talking about? Well, this is a summary of what the United States looked like at the start of the Civil War. And the first thing we should realize is that this is a war of continental scope. 
The southern states have seceded. The northern states are going to have to invade to reestablish the union in those states. If you look at, and if you can see my mouse here, over here by El Paso to Gettysburg, so two battles were fought in those locations, or a battle at each. That distance is the same distance as Paris to Moscow. So we're talking about a conflict of continental scope. And that was one of the reasons it took so long. Because if you look at the other factors, the North had advantages in just almost every way. Start with per, uh, population, 22 million to 9 million. So that's a little better than two to one. But 40% of the South were slaves. They could not serve in the military. So the personnel advantage went over three to one, maybe four to one. And if you look at percent of people who served in the military, uh, the South had about 1.1 million. And that's these little guys here with the weapons. And the North had about 2.2 million. So the North didn't even use their full manpower advantage uh, during the war. If you look at gross national product, and this is in then year dollars, this is not adjusted for inflation. The country's total output was about 4 billion. The North produced 3.1 billion and the South produced about a little less than 1 billion. If you look at the South's production, you'll see that 40% of their economic output was from slave labor and not just agricultural, but their industries. For example, in Richmond, there were 60,000 slaves in Richmond and they worked in factories and mills and things like that. They weren't working on the fields. Uh, moreover, the railroads in the South used slave labor to build much of the lines. And in fact, the Southern railroads listed slaves as capital assets before the war, and then they lost those after the war. Uh, on the other hand, the North, everyone says, well, the North was an industrial country, and you can see it has 10 times the industrial capacity of the South. But the North was largely agrarian. Uh, of that 3 billion industrial product, only 1.5 billion was uh, industrial, 3.3 billion was the total GDP. And so that means like 2 billion was agricultural products. And in fact, during the war, there was a grain shortage in Europe and the Western United States, Northern States were producing a surplus of grain. So most of the railroads were very busy shipping grain to Europe during the war. So the further north you go, the less military traffic you see on the four east-west uh, Union railroads. So the BNO had about 30% military traffic. And then when you get up to the north to the New York Central predecessor railroads, uh, you see only about 2% military traffic. And so as far as they were concerned, there wasn't a war going on. They were just making money. Now, if you look at locomotive production, in the first year of the war, the South produced 19 locomotives at the Tredegar Ironworks in Richmond. From then on, they produced zero locomotives. They obviously had the capability, but the uh, industries were prioritized to do other things like make armor or make weapons. And so uh, they didn't produce any more locomotives throughout the rest of the war. Meanwhile, the North is producing 400 and their locomotive production actually went up during the war and the other producing around 500 locomotives a year. Uh, same situation with track. The South started out with 9,000 miles of track, which is actually a pretty good number. That would be what Germany or England or France had at the start of the war. And the North had about 21,000. By the end of the war, the South was down to about 2,000 miles of operating track. And the North actually added 5,000 miles, not counting the lines that they ran in the South. So now this, these pictures here illustrate some of what I call the overwhelming logistic advantage that the North had. So in the upper left, you see prefabricated bridges being assembled in Alexandria to be used to repair bridges rapidly. Unfortunately, or however I should say, I never have any evidence, I haven't found any evidence that these prefabricated arches were actually used. Uh, on the right, you see artillery stockpiled at City Point, and more importantly, you see an African-American soldier guarding those guns, and he represents the 200 to 250, maybe 300,000 African-Americans that served in the U.S. Army further exacerbating the North's manpower advantage. And then if you look on the bottom, you'll see rail stockpiled in Alexandria, uh, just in case it's needed, whereas the South had no capability to uh, produce new rail during the war. Like I said earlier, they had the capability, they just optimized or prioritized themselves not to, whereas the North had extra rail laying around just in case they needed it. 
There were other philosophical or political differences between the North and the South from a railroad perspective. Every one of them was an advantage for the North. So you start just with the way the tracks were laid out. Northern railroads developed, particularly the big four, to bring the Western grain products to East Coast markets where there was more industry. And so you had four more or less interstate lines going across uh, the United States. Southern railroads did not uh, develop that way. They developed to bring uh, crops to, from the farmland to the nearest port. And so they didn't have a, any line that could go across. And I'll show you some maps in a second. Another thing that the North did was they paid their railroads market or above market rates to move military cargo. And railroads are capitalists. They want to make money even during a war. And so the Northern railroads were more than happy to move military cargo because they knew they'd get paid for it. Meanwhile, in the South, they asked their railroads to pay below market rates and railroaders being capitalists decided to prioritize civilian traffic over military traffic. So as early as 1862, you see Robert E. Lee writing letters to Richmond complaining about the RFMP railroad and how it's not providing support to him. And there was a railroad there that could have done it, but the railroad didn't. Now this, this concept of private ownership, laissez-faire, that was one of the tenets of the Southern philosophy. And it, it actually hurt them because they never had centralized control of their railroad. Northern railroads knew that the federal government would nationalize their railroads if they did not cooperate. So they fully cooperated. And in the way, along the way, they made money. Whereas Southern railroads did not really get organized until May of, or correction, March of 1865. By then it was too late. Meanwhile, in 1862, the United States formed the United States Military Railroad, and it was authorized to take control of any railroad the government deemed necessary to uh, operate for the military. Most of these were in the states that they conquered as they moved in and re uh, reoccupied, uh, the U.S. Military Railroad would take over. However, there were a few examples where the U.S. Military Railroad did take over Northern railroads, uh, for example, the Western Maryland Railroad was taking over for a brief period during the Gettysburg campaign. Hop brought his uh, men up there. They ran that railroad for about a month and they ran it at 10 times its normal capacity. And to do that, they had to get rid of the schedule and they ran trains and convoys. So they would convoy up supplies to Gettysburg and then convoy back wounded to hospitals. Uh, so the US military, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Now, strange as it sounds to us today, there was no interchange between railroads back then. There were two reasons for this. One, the tracks in most towns did not connect, so you couldn't physically do it. And two, even where they did connect, the railroad owners had this mentality that if I let my cars go somewhere else, I'll never see them again. And so that, that sort of per, uh, pervaded during the Civil War. You will see a few examples of interchange but during the war, the U.S. Military Railroad in particular connected a bunch of these lines together and started sending cars back and forth. Uh, Sherman writes in his memoirs about seeing cars from Indiana and uh, Chicago and Illinois way down in Georgia, and that was very unusual. And once that started in the Civil War, it sort of continued after that. And another reason why they didn't interchange very much was no standard gauge, but that's actually a little bit overblown in the popular lore, and I'll show you in a second. So here's a map of what the United States looked like, the railroad, I should say, at the start of the war. And it's color-coded by gauge. So you notice that the South is mostly five-foot gauge. So it was fairly homogeneous. Only in Virginia and North Carolina did you have some standard gauge, four foot eight and a half, and out west, where railroads would start at a river and go to a town because river transport was actually more effective than, than railroads at that time, you'll see some oddball gauges. And if you look at the North, you'll see that the North was actually a little less homogeneous than the South because the Erie, it was six foot gauge. In Ohio, there was all that five foot, four inch gauge, but mostly uh, New England, the Chicago area and uh, the New York, Philadelphia area was four foot eight and a half. And also, if you'll notice, uh, 
you'll say, Bernie, are you lying to us? There is some transcontinental lines on this chart. For example, there's a line that goes from Richmond all the way to Memphis, right? You can follow it. Well, that's actually four different railroads and they do not physically interconnect. So when you get to say um, Knoxville, Tennessee, you actually get to get off one train, go across town and get on the other. Um, okay, so that's interesting. I thought there was some, I, I actually edited it down quite a bit, so I'm trying to go fast. So one of the things when people think about uh, the Civil War is the tactical value. They think of weapons on trains and there's some famous pictures. This is a painting based on the dictator mortar at Petersburg. And then there's this also this uh, rail gun that was developed during the Peninsula Campaign. It was actually a Confederate gun uh, used one time, then parked on a siding. And then at the end of the war, Union soldiers discovered it. Now, why would such a gun not be very effective? Well, one, it has very limited arc where it can aim. The gun does deflect a little bit in the casement, but not much. And two, the gun can only go where the tracks go. And so if, if this gun shows up, you just move around it and it's no longer effective. So they didn't build too many of these. The b &O did build some armored cars that they used to escort their trains. It's a little different function. Uh, so you had infantry in the car behind, that car was armored with wood. And then you have a field piece mounted in an armored car in the front. And there are no known pictures of this car. So I built this model for the b &O Museum and I worked with their curator to try to come up with a reasonable design. We had textual descriptions that John Meigs wrote when they built the car. So we know that they used an existing box car that had a certain load capacity. And we know what kind of gun they put in it. And we know that it was sloped, some type of sloped armor. But other than that, we really didn't know much. So we came up with this. And um, two of them were allegedly destroyed in combat. And supposedly a piece of one survived. But other than that, there are no known photographs or anything else. So if railroads weren't involved in the fighting, what were they doing? Well, they were providing logistic support and strategic movement. Now, this is an example of strategic movement after the Gettysburg campaign. And you will see that, uh, after, I'll set the stage here for you. After the Gettysburg campaign, Lee retreated into Virginia and General Meade followed him. Neither army really was strong enough to attack the other. They were in a kind of a stalemate situation. Meanwhile, in the West, the Western Confederate armies were being defeated. So Lee realized this and he said to Longstreet, take your command, which was about one third of Lee's army, and move to the Chattanooga area and defeat the Union Army there commanded under General Rosecrans and prevent this hemorrhaging that we're having in the West. And they also sent some reinforcements from the Mississippi area. I remember Vicksburg had really fallen by this time and some other locations. So it took the railroad network about 12 days to move 12,000 men. They arrived at the Battle of Chickamauga just in time they defeated the Union Army. The Union Army retreated to Chattanooga where it was besieged. So the Northern strategic leadership, I guess, they get together and they say, well, we've got to react to this. So we're going to take 25,000 men from Meade's army and we're going to ship them to Chattanooga. And it took about 15 days to move those guys over four different railroads. However, four of the days were delays due to a cavalry raid that Morgan had launched from Alabama all the way up to Kentucky and back. So the railroad, the men on the railroad stopped, they guarded the rail line while Morgan was doing his operation. Once Morgan retreated and the Union chased him back, uh, those infantry continued on and artillery to Chattanooga. Meanwhile, Sherman advanced from the Vicksburg area. He actually marched overland. And during this march, he personally was almost captured at a railroad station. His his railroad car was raided by the Confederates and some of his personal effects were captured. But uh, he managed to get through, brought his army with him and with Grant, Grant went up the Mississippi to Cairo, came down into um, Chattanooga area, took command and immediately raised the siege, defeated the Union Confederate army at Missionary Ridge. The Confederates had to retreat toward Atlanta. And at this point, Grant got promoted and moved to Washington and Sherman advanced on Atlanta. So. That's an example of strategic movement. Now, in terms of logistic support, the railroads were good at moving cargo. This particular picture shows what my railroad would be moving in a day. So approximately 60 cars a day, 
um, maybe a little more than that, depending on the day. And the forage for the animals was the number one cargo. Food for humans was the second cargo. There were supplies, things like tents and stoves and weapons uh, that supported massive stores. At the time that I'm modeling, the army is in what they call winter quarters. So they're camped out, they're not actively campaigning. And so men were going home on leave and they were getting mail. I uh, read an article that said, or I read a letter, I should say, that said the family shipped a turkey, a cooked turkey from New York to their son in Virginia. And I said to myself, how could you ship a cooked turkey for Christmas and you know, not have the person die of food poison? And then a couple of years ago, I got invited to a wedding in Syracuse, New York in January 1st. And my wife and I drove up there and it was 19 below zero and our windshield wipers froze. And I said, oh, well, now I know how they shipped that turkey. That thing was frozen solid when they put it on the train. Uh, so anyway, they did a lot of that. Um, also, uh, and I'll talk about this in a minute, soldiers would send their pay home and I'll explain it in a second how that worked. Uh, railroad supplies, the railroad was preparing for the move on Richmond. So they were moving uh, and stockpiling equipment and there is training going on. So the soldiers are firing their weapons to some extent. So you need about 20 tons of ammo a day. So at the start of the war, this is what a supply depot would look like. Basically, any kind of siding or even the main line, you stop, unload the cars onto wagons, because remember, there are no internal combustion engines in, in the Civil War. Once you get off a steamboat or a steam train, you are on human power. And so that's what happens. You get loaded on wagons. And in fact, armies back then, when they talked about their trains, they were actually talking about their wagon train, not their railroad. Railroads were called the cars. So if you read a memoir and a person says, we rode the cars, that means they took the train. By the uh, late, at the end of the war, the Union at least, their supply depots had become extremely elaborate. So City Point, you have a mile of wharfs. It becomes the busiest port in the United States. At, at the start of the war, interestingly, New Orleans was the busiest port. But City Point became the busiest port uh, during 1865, Mr. Grant's army was camped out here. And they developed specialized wharfs uh, for different commodities. They had an ammunition wharf that was placed out in the river because earlier an ammo dump exploded, possibly due to sabotage. And so they, they were really quite uh, organized. They also developed a car ferry and this was the first known car float. There were some railroad ferries. There was a very important one at, from Harbor to Grace um, up in Baltimore across the Susquehanna River to Perryville, I think it is. And um, no, wait a minute, they're on the same side of the river. Whatever was on the other side, I can't remember. But um, that was a, a train would drive on to the uh, ferry, would go across on the steam power, and then continue on to Washington. This was a case where they would load the cars onto a float and have a tugboat push the float. So this is the first known example of this. And you can see that because they used existing barges to do it, the cars were loaded transversely, not longitudinally. And Hopp wrote a memo that I have a copy of where he describes this operation. And he said it took about an hour to load and unload this float. And I uh, also have the schedule or the records of this float. It was typically one float each way from Alexander to City Point per day. Now as model railroaders, we like to build models and we like to have variety our models. And in the Civil War, there's not the variety of cars you have today. There are tank cars, no intermodal cars, uh, but you do have some variety within your, uh, with your rolling stock. For example, if you look at this picture in Nashville, you'll see that each one of the boxcars in this picture is slightly different. The first one we see here, 478, is a combination car, and then there's various different kinds of boxcars behind it. And so the, if you have to scratch build things, you won't have to scratch build the same thing over and over again. You'll have some variety in your modeling. Uh, I mentioned soldiers sending home their money. Well, that was done using the Adams Express Company, and the Adams Express had their own cars back then. Not all, not all railroads had Adams Express cars, but some of them did. 
And this is an example of one of them. I believe this picture is in Atlanta. And uh, I also found this little ad in the New York Times during the Civil War. And if you'll see, it's the Adams Express Company advertising to Northern families that they are now open for business on the Quail Line where I'm, my railroad is mauling. And so therefore, I know that the Adams Express operated on my railroad. Furthermore, I found uh, train order reports or conductor's reports that list express cars on my railroad. So I do know that express cars ran on my line. So I have, I have built a, a model of those. We also had uh, the president like to visit the front lines back then. He visited my railroad, I believe, four times. He visited City Point at least once, and I think twice. And uh, they actually took a passenger car for him at City Point and armor plated it. So it's possible that this is the first presidential car, the first Air Force One. When Lincoln visited my railroad, he did not have a passenger car. They took a box car, put benches inside and decorated it with bunting. And uh, that is something I haven't built on my railroad yet. I really need to do that. Meanwhile, back in Alexandria, they were building a dedicated car for the president. So this really would have been the first Air Force One. And this was a very elaborate car. It had four trucks, all the brake, all trucks were braked, and it had some, supposedly a smooth riding car. The only drawback was Lincoln did not like this car. He thought it was too ostentatious, and he never actually rode it as a president. He did ride it as a uh, during his funeral when his body was taken uh, back to Springfield. And this is what that car looked like during the funeral train. You'll notice it's decorated with black bunting. And again, this is a model that I built for the B&O Museum. And it's a 1 32nd scale model. And it was making that bunting was very difficult. I actually had to make another car, uh, use two pot epoxy to mold the bunting, let it dry, pop it off, and then put it on this car. I couldn't build them in situ because of the way the car was pre-painted. Anyway, that was a lot of work. Also notice the railing on the back was detachable. so when the train stopped, they could take his coffin out and put it on display at the various locations. Now in terms of motive power, you can have any locomotive you want in the Civil War era, except it's gotta be a four for row. Okay, I'm actually exaggerating. That's not entirely true, but for my railroad, it is true. But the positive note is look how gorgeous these engines were back then. Uh, this is the Devereaux. This is a standard US military railroad engine decorated. It's named after a superintendent of the uh, railroad in Virginia, who is Devereaux. And uh, just, just a gorgeous engine. They were kept very shiny. The men took pride in their equipment. They wiped them down at every stop and oiled them and did things like that. Now, there were some other wheel arrangements that were used, especially the B&O, the Northern Central, and the Penzi. They had a lot of variety in their uh, motive power. So this is a surviving example of a 460 up at the B&O Museum. Uh, the B&O also ran camelbacks and the Northern Central had a lot of camelbacks and mud diggers. Uh, if you like coal hauling and a coal hauling railroad, then the one you want to model in the Civil War is the Northern Central. They, they were uh, probably 30% roughly coal hauling railroad back then. So these are some other uh, factors. I'm going to not go over them too detailed because it takes too long, but these are just things that were different back then. So I mentioned steam engines. Uh, back then, rail was made out of iron, not steel. Now, there was some steel rail, but it was very rare. Steel rail for the United States was imported from Britain. So if you ever go out to um, the Centerville area, you'll see some signs on Route 29, I think it is, that talk about the Manassas to Centerville Railroad. That was a line that the Confederates built using steel rail that they stole from the B&O. And because that rail was so durable and so valuable, when the war was over, the B&O got that rail back and reused it. Normal wrought iron rail would wear out much quicker and um, was made in 28 foot sections back then. And it was actually connected with wooden splices, which is kind of interesting. They also had stub switches back then, not blade switches. I'll show an example of that. Stub switches were easier to make, but they took more maintenance and they had a fatal flaw. If you went across a stub switch 
and it's set the wrong way, you derail. So it, it's like a modern derail. It, and there was a, a terrible accident in Colorado in the 1870s where the stub switch was set the wrong way, a passenger train went over it and killed about 60 people. After that, the stub switches were outlawed by Congress. Um, telegraph, I'll talk a little bit about. Lincoln pin couplers, I will show you a little video, but uh, Lincoln pin couplers was the original way of doing this, was very dangerous. Uh, not so much losing your finger as so much as actually just getting killed and crushed by the cars because the operator had to stand between the two cars to, to effectuate a Lincoln pin. On my railroad, it's not as dangerous. We use magnets and track nails. Uh, another interesting thing is that there were no air brakes in the Civil War, and cars had handbrakes on one truck only. Now, most modern freight cars have the handbrake on one truck only, but they also have air brakes. Well, you only have the handbrake on the Civil War. And so one of the side shoots of that is that I was able to make working brakes on some of my cars, not all of them, but some of them. And I'll show you an example in a minute. It was also the first example of hospital cars, uh, particularly in the North. They built some really nice uh, hospital cars with suspended bunks, uh, a heater to keep people warm in the winter, uh, an attendant who would actually have service for water and go up and down and take care of the people. Um, prior to that, they would just basically put a straw on a box car. They would actually indicate straw as medical product, uh, clean straw, and that would be used for bunks and to make uh, box cars into ambulances. I mentioned the car ferry, so I won't go into that too much. Now, photography is interesting. The, we do have photographs from the Civil War, but not that many. In the Library of Congress and National Archives, there's about 6,000 photographs, and 3,000 of those roughly are portraits. To put that in perspective, and for World War I in the archives, there's about 600,000 photos, and for World War II, there's like 6 million photos. So there aren't that many to pick from. But the good news is these images were made with 8 by 10 or 8 by 11 glass plate negatives. And so they have incredible resolution. So you can really zoom in and, and look at stuff on these pictures. Um, talk a little bit later about the structure of railroads. They proved to be much harder to destroy than people think. And one of the reasons for that is that they got good at rebuilding them, including the bridges. So here's an example of a stub switch at Atlanta. And those of you that are, uh, are astute will notice that this is actually a double slip stub switch because one turnout control is controlling four different routes. So if you look at that box car up on the right and follow its track, if it were to continue on that track, it's going to derail because the rail set the wrong way. So that illustrates how that works. The other thing about um, this era is there wasn't a lot of iron for construction projects. So everything was made out of wood with wrought iron supports. So this bridge is a wooden bridge with wrought iron supports, uh, truss rods for supports. However, one cool thing about this particular shot is that bridge is actually a swing bridge. That center section can pivot to let steamboats go by. This is down in Nashville, the Cumberland River. Also, the bridge was provided with some armor protection to protect the guards in case it was ever raided. And if you like big bridges, there were big bridges in the Civil War. This is a uh, trestle that was replacing a truss that was burned by the Confederates when they retreated near Farmville right at the very end. The Union rebuilt that trestle and it stayed that way for several years until it got rebuilt as a truss. In terms of operations, uh, I mentioned this was early timetable and train order. And what you see here is the train sheet from Alexandria for the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, which goes from Alexandria out to Manassas and then out to Orange, Virginia. And during the war, it was going out to Brandy Station in this particular date. So you went from Alexandria to Brandy Station. And this is how dispatcher kept track of the trains. Uh, so this is early stages of train order control. If you get, if you like to do train order and timetable operations or timetable and train order, most people say, um, you'll notice that now the rule book is something like 240 pages long with hundreds of rules. Back then the rule book was 10 pages long and there were really only about four pages of those were rules. And basically the most important rule is don't leave on time. 
or don't leave before your time. And uh, the other thing was how to signal your train, uh, which I mentioned now a white represents an extra, but back then a white represented a scheduled train and red represented an extra. So it's actually opposite what we're doing now. There was a lot of military interference and accidents. I'm not going to cover that too much, uh, but it did happen. Uh, even the telegraph uh, had problems because once the military started actively campaigning, they would monopolize the telegraph. And so the railroad guys could not get their messages in. So unless the railroad had its own telegraph line, which the union did in a few spots, uh, they could not rely on the telegraph to do their operations. So they, they either had to do timetable and train order and work strictly by schedule or run in convoys, which I mentioned earlier on the uh, Western Maryland they did. I did talk about winter quarters. Uh, winter quarters is interesting from the railroad perspective because my railroad, we're not fighting, we're camped out for six months. So we're actually running a scheduled operation, just, just like in peacetime, except you're a military customer. Once you get into active campaigning, the units are moving, the rails may or may not keep up, the railroads are being cut. And so the operational aspect is less interesting because the railroading is more sporadic. Uh, so it's more interesting, I think, to model the winter quarters when you're operating to a schedule. And guerrilla action happened. Uh, I mentioned Morgan's raid. There were lots of raids. I just finished reading a book about railroad raiders in the Civil War, and uh, it went on on both sides. But the truth is that it was very hard to permanently cut a railroad line, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Everyone's heard about the Great Chase. I don't cover it too much other than that the first Medals of Honor were issued to, I believe, seven of the uh, participants on the Union side of the Great Chase, but not the leader because he was a civilian. Now, this guy, Herman Hopp, probably people have heard of him. He's considered a railroad genius. He went to West Point at age 14. He was a little guy who's, I think, 130 pounds as an adult, about five foot two. Um, but he was really good at railroads. So he worked for the Penzi. He wrote a bridge, a book on bridge building. Uh, he even wrote a math textbook. And then when the war broke out, he was working in Massachusetts on the Hoosick Tunnel. And he was called down to help straighten out the logistics problems that they were having. And he came up with these four or five rules. And uh, I mentioned no military officer, military interference was a big issue. Send the supplies forward only as needed and unload them as soon as possible. So everybody's heard about Patton and World War II and how in September he had to stop moving because he ran out of supplies. And you know, Patton famously said, Rommel, I read your book. Well, the reason they stopped was because the Quartermaster Corps had violated the third rule on this list. They were taking the boxcars that were being loaded at the ports, sending them forward, and then using them as warehouses. And so they were not returning. So there was a shortage of train cars. So they had to rely on trucks in the Red Ball Express to try to make up the difference. So what I tell people is if Patton had read Hop's book instead of Rommel's book, he might not have gotten stuck on the front like he did. Uh, I mentioned this problem with the telegraph earlier and the convoying, so I won't go over that. <coughs> now, much of the paperwork for my railroad has survived at the National Archives. This is the one downtown. And if you go over there and you get your ID card and everything squared away, you can go in and see the actual paperwork that uh, my railroad used to operate. So you see train orders on the left. The 32 is a, uh, a telegraph code that they use explained in the little box at the bottom. And on the right, or I mean in the middle, you see conductor's reports. So every train that ran on the railroad would list what cars they had, where they picked them up, where they dropped them off, and what was in them. And so I could actually go back and recreate a day on my railroad if I wanted to. And then that other thing you see on the right is a list of the cars that were in Alexandria that were not US military railroad box cars. And so I went through that book and mostly you see B&O, uh, uh, Philadelphia, Wilmington and Baltimore, Northern Central and one or two privately owned cars and that was it. The rest of them were U.S. military railroad cars. So on my particular railroad, we really don't see any foreign cars. I've been tempted to make a couple anyway, just because it's vaguely conceivable that it happened, but it probably would didn't. Anyway, that was that's a nice for you know most people don't have <coughs> this kind of paperwork available for their railroad. 
All right, so now let's talk a little bit about my road. How are we doing on time, by the way? Oh, we're doing okay. Um, so this is what I'm modeling. This is a scene on my railroad. This is Potomac Creek. And so earlier I showed you this map. And where am I modeling? Well, that little circle shows a 13 mile piece of the RFMP in Virginia. So the RFMP went from Richmond to Fredericksburg to the Potomac. It did not make it all the way to Washington at this time. So if you were a passenger that wanted to go from Richmond to Washington before the war, you would get on your train at Richmond, take it up to a quiet landing where you would get off the train and there'd be a steamboat waiting for that train. You would get on the steamboat and then an hour or so later you were in Washington. And actually, you know, we say, oh my, that sounds so inconvenient. But people back then preferred steamboats. They were more comfortable, they weren't as dirty, they didn't shake and vibrate. And so it was actually a feature, not a bug, if you want to put it in that terms. But what that means is that the railroad that I'm modeling goes from a quiet landing, which if you can see my mouse, is right over there, and then at 13 miles down to Fredericksburg. Now, in 1862, the US military had operated this down to about Guinea Station. But in the time period I'm modeling, this bridge is out. The Confederates are on this side of the river. Notice how they're really spread out. This is only one third of Lee's army. The rest of it is spread out more because he has to forage to get his supplies because the railroad has been inadequate. Meanwhile, the North has got their 100,000 to 120,000 men. They're encamped in a really tight circle, what we would call a perimeter these days. They have cavalry out West screening and there's lots of little engagements out here during the winter. But for the most part, these guys are camping out and they're being supplied by this railroad. They, the Union did build a second wharf down here that went into deeper water so bigger ships could come in. And so that's called Burnside's Wharf, also called um, oops, Yuba Dam, depending on how you spell it, U-B Damned or Y-U-B-A. I've seen both. And there are only four stops. There's Brook, Toma Creek, Soma Station, which is now Leland, and then Falmouth. So let's look at each stop, the pictures that I have that support it. So this is the main wharf at Aquia Landing. And you can see on the bottom picture, there are rails on the pier. There's even a turnout on the pier. And then up above, right over here, it's hard to see, but there are railroad cars there. There's another ferry right there. The one thing we cannot see in either of these pictures is the bridge, the transfer bridge, you know, with the overhead gantry. So I don't really know what that looked like. So I just assumed it looked like the one in Virginia or in Alexandria. Uh, so that's pretty busy, lots of ships pulling in there because there is no railroad connection. So all the supplies for the Union Army are coming into a quiet landing. They're being transferred from the ships and barges to the trains and then taken out to the people or direct to wagons if the troops are close to the, the port. And here are some more scenes of a quiet landing, probably about 20 pictures of a quiet landing, maybe 30 exist. And uh, one of the things you see is a lot of people, a lot of people standing around. You have women visiting their husbands. Uh, usually the officers' wives are come, but there were also some of the soldiers that had their wives follow them and they would be what they call camp followers and they would help cook and do laundry. Um, kind of risky, most of the women stayed home and got their husband's salary uh, via Aria, uh, Adams Express. The next stop on the line is Stoneman Station, and we have a, just a couple pictures. This bottom picture is actually two different photographs that I stitched together using Photoshop. And what looks like happened is the photographer went on top of a boxcar and set up his camera and then just panned it and took two shots. And then it took, you know, 100 years later, someone to stitch them together and make one panorama of uh, Stoneman Station. But look over here, which is kind of cool. This is a conductor's car or a way car. They really didn't call them cabooses back then, although I have seen a few written references where the word caboose was used. Uh, they set this up on blocks to use as a telegraph station. So I know, that was kind of cool. The next stop is Potomac Creek, which was the major obstacle 
the terrain here is swampy with a ridge that cuts across the swamp and then the creek cuts through the ridge. So it's really not like a canyon per se, it's just a ridge that's been cut. And so the railroad was riding on top of the ridge, they had to bridge this. And so the RFMP built a nice trestle there, but there are no known pictures of it. And I have asked all over looking for those. Uh, it probably looked like this bridge down here, the one I built. Um, this is the famous beam pole and cornstalk bridge, the first one that Hop built in 62 that was burned. They built another trestle, which we don't really have pictures of, that's down here. They replaced it with this bridge, which is the truss bridge. That got burned in 63. And when Grant came through, he built another bridge, another trestle, used it for nine days and abandoned it, and that was burned sometime later. So there have actually been five bridges here if you count the RFMPs bridge. This is the one that I chose to model. This is the uh, truss bridge. It's a pretty cool looking bridge. It's very big, it's very high. Uh, you can see the old pilings, cribbings, I mean, for the pilings at the bottom. And I'll show you that when I build it, my model of it. So here's a question, what scale should I model? Okay, uh, initially back in about eight, 1990, yeah, 1890, 1990, I actually tried building an end scale Civil War era railroad and the locomotives, the Bachman 440s, just did not work well enough. So I abandoned that project. Uh, what you see here is an end scale locomotive and boxcar sitting on top of an O scale flat car. There are no some nice end scale locomotives out that run better than the Bachman, but they still don't compare to the O scale ones that I have. There are some guys doing some really nice work in HO scale. And HO obviously has that um, you know, volume factor that you can do the whole Atlanta station and fit it on a railroad. That would be very big on my railroad, probably be about six feet long. Um, but I did not like the figures in HO scale. I thought the figures were kind of clunky. And as you can tell, I like painting and building figures. So I actually considered doing this in 132nd scale because 132nd scale, you have every Civil War figure you could possibly think of, every piece of military equipment is available. There's just no railroad equipment available, so you have to scratch build it. Well, when Schneider came out with, uh, Schneider came out with his locomotives, that convinced me to try O scale, and I bought a few of them, got into it, and I got hooked. Now, this is Alicia standing with the boat that Andy and I were just talking about at the start. And one of the things you realize is that O scale is big. It's, uh, you know, to quote the guy from Jaws, we're going to need a bigger layout. So if you look at MRP a couple of years ago, I, I wrote an article that describes how my initial plan evolved and started to expand into the rest of the basement. And one time we had some guys working on our kitchen and they offered to reconfigure some closets in my basement, including all the wiring for like $300. And so I had them do it, and that created enough space for me to have this railroad here. <clears throat> so down here we have a quiet landing, a little, a little hint of Burnside's Wharf. This should really be about a mile away from a quiet landing. In fact, the Y should be up here. And one day my neighbor was visiting with her grandchildren, and I was explaining that Burnside Wharf really should be over here and would be in her house. And she goes, oh, that'd be wonderful. So she was like, said, yeah, we could just tunnel through the, between our two yards and connect. I don't think she really understood what I was saying. But anyway, uh, so we've got Burnside Wharf. We come up into Brook. That's my first town. There are no photographs of Brook. You notice I skipped Brook in my talk. So this was where I did some freelancing. I've got buildings from all over Virginia in there. Come around to Potomac Creek where the big bridge is. And we have Stoneman Station. And then we ended in Falmouth, which, uh, it worked pretty well, but it was really too cramped up in here. And that turnout right there was never reliable. So I ended up having to blue flag it. So that limited me to basically a six car train that could fit into the siding up here. And we worked with it for a couple of years, but you'll see what happened later. So here's some of the challenges though. So you wanna build a railroad at O scale. Well, here's the problem. You can get locomotives. Well, let me rephrase that. You could have gotten locomotives, they're out of production now and the company is gone. So you'd only be able to buy them uh, on the used market and they occasionally pop up. The good news is you don't need a lot of them. I have 
five, I believe. I had six. I sold one to Bob Brown at the Narrow Gauge Gazette. So he has my old um, general. I didn't need the general on my railroad. And I'm actually scratch building the leech, which I showed you uh, earlier. You can get some wheel sets, you can get some figures. Everything else you're pretty much gonna have to scratch build. But that fit fine with me because I'm, above all things, I'm a model builder before I am a model railroader. And so I like building models. So that really wasn't an issue for me. And so here's how I'm building my railroad. This is the front room that uh, is basically done now. Just a few little details here and there need to be added, but not much. I would say 99% done up there. Uh, I'm using battery powered logos. Some of them are also DCC. Uh, I've used my laser cutter exclusive or extensively to build some stuff. I've also gotten into 3D printing. I've done some spin casting and photo etching, and now we're trying to get microprocessors. So if you read Model Railroad, I did an article a couple of years ago about the high-tech approach, and that was all of the stuff here. So it's an old railroad, but we're looking at it from a, from a high-tech perspective. So I mentioned SMR, he made these beautiful locomotives. And I mean, when the first one came out, I saw it was the general and I didn't buy it. I said, oh, that's cool. But it was, I don't know, $1,500 or something. Then he came out with a Texas and he ran a sale. So I got it for like $300 off. So I bought one and I said, well, let me just test run it. And it ran really well. And I was working on an in-scale Rio Grande layout at the time, which was an MRP about 20 years ago. And uh, I said, well, let me just build a little test section. And I built the test section. And the next thing you know, my end scale was done. And I was building an O-scale Civil War Railroad. And he gradually came out with a couple other locos, these masons here. So that's a mason. And that's a mason. And then he came out with the Osceola. Well, actually, this was the Yona. But because the Yona was very similar to the Osceola, same locomotive company, same year manufacturer, uh, I had them build that one for me and custom decorate it as the Osceola. So I have five, the general is gone, and I'm in the process of scratch building one, the leech. So two of the locos have the battery system. They are the workhorses. They really run well. They, they chug through shorts. Uh, if they derail, they keep going. The other three locos also run pretty well, but they have DCC with current keepers. So they will short, a uh, correction, if they short, they will stop running. Whereas the battery locos, if, if a piece touches, like a lot of times the pilot truck will contact the uh, some place on the frame that it's not supposed to and cause a short and that will stall the engine, whereas battery ones don't do that. And that's because I have tight radius, radii on my railroad, which is an issue I am addressing. So here we see an example of, whoops. Here we see an example of what happens if you get off the rails. These locomotives will keep running. So you do have to be alert as the uh, engineer on the railroad. And I do use two-man crews, an engineer and a conductor, sometimes three-man crews, but two can handle it very well. So basically, I have DCC on my railroad, and then the locos charge themselves off of that DCC. So I never have to charge up my railroad like before an obsession. I don't really have to charge. I can just turn on the power an hour or two early and make sure that they're uh, drawing current because dirty wheels is still an issue. Uh, but if the wheels are clean and they're drawing current, they will charge themselves. The real problem is trying to fit all the electronics in there because there's a battery, there's a battery power supply, there's a decoder, and then there's a sound chip. So it's tricky to get all that stuff in these locomotives. Packaging is a little easier with a Tsunami, uh, with a current keeper. Um, the top one is the Osceola, which has an empty tender. There's no motor in the tender. The bottom one is the uh, Hop, which has a big motor in the tender with two big gear drives. And so the battery is sitting inside that box with the baffle, and then I covered it with wood. And uh, engines back then, by the way, used mostly wood. And by the way, that locomotive sounds really good. Both of those actually sound really good. That little sugar cube speaker on the, on the Osceola sounds good. The drawback to Osceola is because it's so light, it can't pull much. Now, I did use my laser cutter. This was the first laser that I owned. I had it for about 12 years. I sold it, and I got a, a bigger laser, but uh, this one's 40 watts, and uh, it just barely fits in my garage. And with that, I built a lot of stuff. You know, the old saying is when you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. 
And so I made a lot of stuff on my laser cutter, not just for my business, but also for the railroad. So that train bolting thing has been engraved on the laser and even passenger car seats from my passenger car were cut on the laser. Uh, you can cut wood, acrylic, styrene is very tricky to cut. It tends to melt, so you can't make sharp corners. You cannot cut any kind of vinyl that releases chlorine gas, which will destroy your machine. And I cannot cut metal. You need at least 100 watts to cut metal. My big bridge I built using laser cut parts. And in a way, it's the way the real pro railroad did it because the parts for that bridge were prefabbed in Alexandria and brought down and assembled like Lincoln logs on site with basically just a hammer. They were able, they banged, they banged pins in. And so I built it a similar way. The, the parts were cut so precisely that they basically jigged themselves. And I can also do things like make detail parts. This is a little O scale tool set that I made with my laser. I also sell it with Alchem scale models. It's like a 19th, early 20th century toolkit with different saws and planes and chisels and stuff. Most of my rolling stock, in fact, all of my rolling stock is scratch built. Uh, most of them have scratch built trucks, although I do have a few, I think I have three commercial trucks that I bought, but they were $45 each. And so I decided it'd be a little more economical to make my own. And I've also scratch built an Adams Express car based on that photo we saw, and we know that ran on my line. And uh, I built a couple of weight cars or conductors cars. And because this one is for the um, NMRA uh, achievement program, right? So you have to make a couple cars that are really good. So this one I did a full interior on and honestly had a lot of fun doing this. And if you look over here, the little conductor's desk, those are actually scaled down replicas of the actual paperwork they used. And there's even an O-scale pencil over there, which I thought was kind of neat. Of course, my wife liked the pillow on the bed. Now we do use Lincoln pin couplers on our railroad. This is the early style of doing it. It's, it's not that easy to do. It's, it's harder than just knuckle couplers on your HO cars, but it is doable. Some people, uh, particularly people who have uh, unsteady hands or bad vision, they will have trouble with these. But basically, if you come to my railroad and you have trouble like that, then you become the engineer and we'll put uh, a taller or you know, younger person as your conductor. And so generally we can make it work. And the track nails are the pins and the, the links are not magnetic. They're laser cut from resin impregnated cardboard. And so when you want to uncouple, you'll use a magnet. I'll show you an example. Now, the noses of the cars have these extended links. These are the way the prototype worked. And I had to build these from our cars because the man who built these models, the Koreans or whoever, they made them true to scale and they did not articulate right and left enough. So I had to make some new ones that had a little more uh, freedom of movement because of my tight radii. And the hole over here is much harder to line up because here you have a big link that's maybe a half inch long to work with. Here you have to get that track nail in a little tiny hole. So we tend not to use the link on the front and I also have a limit of two cars pushing. So you can push two cars with the extended link, but you can pull a whole train if you want. The reason for that is most of my engines are tender drive. And if you have too much load, pushing load right on that nose, you can derail the engine. So here's a little video of operators working on my railroad. All right, he just pulled the pin. And now his engineer is pulling forward. And the conductors, he's the conductor brakeman. And then he was telling me, we're gonna go past that turnout and then back in and unhook. Now, if you really wanna see how this works, go to my YouTube channel. And I have a video called How to Operate My Railroad. And it goes into depth on how to run the Lincoln pins on the railroad. I have used spin casting uh, to produce parts for my railroad. I bought one of these little spin caster setups from a company in Rhode Island. And I, I really haven't used it in a couple of years. Um, I'm actually thinking about selling it in case if somebody wants to buy a spin caster, it's got the vulcanizer, that's what this is. There's your hot metal thing and that's the spin caster. And if you ever wanna make a lot of one piece, it's very handy for that. 
For example, here's a cannon from our railroad. Uh, the, the barrel is cast metal. The wheels are cast metal. The chassis is laser cut wood. And then the little details are photo etched. So it's a multimedia kit. I actually sell those. And um, what is photo etching, by the way? Well, if you've never heard of it, it's a process where you do a computer drawing make a film, put that film on metal that's been treated, and then it can be etched in acid to make the parts that you want. It can be very finely detailed parts, but they have to be flat. That's the difference. And so those are some restrictions on your artwork. And one of the things I was able to do with photo etching is make my switch stands. Now these are to scale size. So other than the fact that the human is 48 times bigger than it should be, that person just switched a scale size switch stand, which I think is kind of neat. I don't know too many other railroads that have scale size switch stands on the railroads. There are some, some guys do it in HO I know, but uh, I just thought that was a neat feature. Oops, wait a minute. Now for photo etching, I have a small business that does a lot of photo etch stuff. This is an example of one of my kits. Uh, this is the Thurman Cold Dock. And the parts are extremely precise. They're stronger than wood, but, it costs a lot of money to get your first piece made. And one of the problems I have is in the Civil War, there weren't that many things that were made out of metal that could be photo etched. So I'm kind of limited in my railroad. If I was modeling a more modern era, I could probably come up with uh, more ideas for photo etched parts. One of the things I did do was make working brakes on my railroad. So here's a little demonstration of how the brakes work. So there the brakes are not set. Now you take the wheel and you, you turn the hand wheel. Don't turn it too far because you're gonna put a side load on the truck and you could derail the truck. Now the brakes are holding. And then when you wanna release the brake, you just turn the hand wheel. Now, when you're operating my railroad, I don't expect you to run along the tops of all the cars and turn all the brake wheels. You don't have to do that. You just turn the knob on the throttle. We don't actually use the working brakes that much in an up session. Um, because I'm a Polish engineer, I have a siding that's built on a grade. And so that's where the, the cars that have working brakes are the ones that get sent to that siding. The rest of the cars don't go there. Now, I have gone into 3D printing recently. I wish I had started this 10 years ago because it isn't as hard as I thought. And it's going to dominate the future of model railroading. When I first dabbled in 3D printing, I had my friends do the artwork, and then we had Shapeways print it, and then I spin cast. So here's, here's a master, and then I made a mold of that, and I spin cast a bunch of trucks. So my trucks are metal, some of them are. Others are made out of wood. By the way, this one is a Proto 48 truck, and this one is a non-Proto 48 truck. So you can see the difference. It's about 60 thousandths of an inch too wide when you do five foot gaze like I'm doing. Now, one thing I'm working on now is that I'm trying to 3D print most of this locomotive. This is the leech. And uh, I was working on this last winter and I stopped working on it for a while and I really need to get back and finish this up. Uh, but the leech was an interesting locomotive. It had this sort of wide wheelbase, which was kind of worked out pretty well because the British guys make a drive train that'll fit right in there. And so hopefully one day we'll see the leech running on my railroad. I'm also dabbling in the microprocessor, but anyone who knows me knows that I hate wiring. And this system takes a lot of wiring. Uh, the program, the, the Morse code itself is gonna be generated by a computer. So the way this is gonna work is watch, watch this finger here, watch this little video, turn your sound up. Notice it's set to four. That tells the computer what train number you are. And then you select a switch for regular or extra, and then you push a button, and the computer will generate the dot code. Message. And it will repeat that in case you missed it the first time. Here it comes, watch. Oh, 
Okay, so the way the reason that they use the dot code was if if you ever do railroad Morse, and if you go to the B and O Museum, they have a room where railroad Morse is being played. Those guys can go really fast, and it uh, it takes a lot of training to learn it. It almost um, sounds like not a song, but a, you get to recognize the patterns. My dad, who was a telegraph operator during World War II, told me that after a while you don't hear the dots, you hear the words, which I thought was really cool. Um, but it takes a long time to train people. They needed a lot of operators. So they came up with this modified code called the dot code, which you basically count the dots. It's either gonna be one, two or three dots with a slight gap in between. Now we have this set up, by the way, I gotta give a plug to uh, Seth Newman and Steve Williams out in California. I did this like a military contractor. I wrote a spec about how I wanted this to work. I gave it to Seth and Steve. They built the hardware and wrote the code to my spec. They actually made some embellishments. Like I did not spec out that light, but they added that typical contractors gold plating their systems. However, in my case, they only charged me $200 for this, which is amazing considering what they did. I have one working station, so it's, that doesn't make much of a telegraph. So really what I need to do is get some folks that don't mind wiring things. We've got to make four more of those stations and then we have to run that cable. Now, I don't have like a data bus. So the cable, it, it has to run, um, it's just a pair of wires from every station to the central uh, dispatch, which will be right behind me. Anyway, so that's my telegraph system. I hope it works someday. And that's the dispatcher's desk where the telegraph will be set up. So you can see I've got, I've got the hardware. I just don't have the electronics set up yet. Uh, this is actually during an op session. You can notice the most important thing is we got the cookie jar. And uh, there's the train sheet. That's the schedule and a few other little messages and things that the dispatcher uses. Also, this, uh, this flag, if you look behind me now, you'll notice that I've replaced the vinyl flag with a cotton flag. So I do have the correct flag from my era, a 34 star flag. Now, the internet was another high tech thing that we use for our railroad. And we do have um, a, a chat group on the groups IO. It has gigabytes and gigabytes of documents stored on there. So we have a little $5 fee that DC this fellow over here, let's see, where's DC, this guy. He manages it. We send him money every year and he sets up the group so we can store all our stuff. I also have my blog, if you ever wanna see what I'm up to, not just model railroading, but other things that I do, uh, military modeling, museum models, even car racing, I will post on my blog. And uh, now if we have time, do we have time? I think we do. I'll show you some pictures of what my railroad looks like uh, so far. Now this is a Falmouth engine terminal. This piece of railroad has been taken down, it's been redone, and I'll show you that in a minute. Then we come over Claiborne Creek, which is a military style trestle. Those of you who have built trestles will see that the, the trestle vents are different. It's a W as opposed to vertical. Herman Hopp came up with this design to save wood. And here we see Osceola going over that trestle. Osceola is really, Cool, great sounding engine, but it's very wimpy. It really can only pull about four cars. So we use Osceola for the general special. There's a message that said that an engine would be kept in steam wherever their commanding officer was. So if he was at Falmouth, there would be an engine waiting for him at Falmouth and vice versa at a quiet landing. So we keep, I keep um, that engine as the general special. And during an obsession, if somebody finishes early, they can run the general special. Here we come by Stoneman Station. You can see that I made the foreground trees with wire. Uh, they're pretty big, they're like 18 inches high. And last month, no, two months ago, one of my fluorescent lights fell out of the ceiling and it landed on the railroad. It did hit a train, but it didn't hurt the train. It broke a telegraph wire and it landed on one of my wire trees. And these wire trees are built intentionally durable and it held up the lamp so that didn't do any real damage. Uh, so all, my, all the big trees in the foreground are wire. And that way, if an operator 
uh, hits them with his elbow or something by accident, they won't really hurt the tree. In fact, they'll probably get cut. So you want to be careful around the wire trees. There's my bridge at Potomac Creek. It's, uh, this is right before I poured the water. The water scene is now uh, finished. That, that area is done. It's about 50% reduction of the actual bridge. There's the other side of Potomac Creek where we have some cabins and things. I have one picture that shows this area, so I tried to copy it as best I could. This is my favorite part of the railroad. It's really just a track going through the woods and through a cut. And it's just a simple scene, but to me, it just, it just, it just looks like a railroad to me, especially the way the backdrop blended in with the foreground. Uh, I'm really happy with the way this came out. So it's my favorite scene on the railroad. There's another view of it. Uh, I call it Wylop's Cut because both Paul Dolkus and J.B. Wylop helped build this area, but J.B. Uh, helped do some of the rocks, so I, I call it after him. As you come around the cut, you uh, cross Ekakee Creek. There was no water mill there, but this is based on the water mill in Piney Creek uh, up in Fairfax County. This building is still standing. You can go look at it if you want. It's on private property, but you can see it from the road. The only thing is the water wheel is now missing. And so I wanted a water wheel on my railroad. The actual building has graffiti from Civil War soldiers carved into the wood on the inside. So I just thought it'd be kind of neat to put it on the railroad. Like I said, Brook, I have no photos of the Brook area. I do know that they had a sawmill somewhere on my railroad. So I put it at Brook. And then if you look at the buildings at Brook, they're all from different spots. So that stone building in the background is from Manassas. Uh, it's actually built to S scale for force perspective, as are these soldiers. These soldiers are S scale soldiers. Uh, this is down in Halifax, Virginia. It was a warehouse. And then there are a couple other buildings at Brook. And here we see a train pulling in the brook. This guy, Gordon, is interesting because he was the first millionaire in the United States who made money not on real estate through commercial interests. So all the millionaires before him, Jefferson, Washington, Mason, all those guys, they made their money on land. Gordon made his money trading tobacco and cotton. He had a warehouse in Falmouth. Um, and since I didn't have any pictures of Brooke, I gave him a warehouse in Brooke. He probably didn't have one there, but that's freelance. And uh, here's the, the tavern at Brook. And we have one of the few females on the railroad and she's caught the doctor sneaking out without trying to pay his bill. In the, in the railroad out modeling, when the Union Army got there, all the white Southerners fled South, all the slaves escaped to the North and became free. And a few people, few white people stayed because they were pro-Union. And so this woman is one of those. She stayed to keep an eye on her house. And I'll show you later, there's another example of that. So the real railroad did not have any tunnels, but the real railroad doesn't have to go through a closet and behind the bathroom. And so I built a tunnel on my railroad and I call it Close A Tunnel based on Crozet who built that, the Virginia Central's tunnel up in the Blue Ridge. Um, and I have Close A Tunnel. And Aquila Landing is still a work in progress. It's been a work in progress for a long time. Um, I did enlist some help this summer. And so if you guys know Brian Boyles, he's actually helping me build one of my ships. And I need to finish the big paddle wheeler and a bunch of structures and a lot of details that still have to go into Aquila Landing. However, that flag is an interesting story. I found a message in the archives that talked about um, Wilbur Wright Wilbur Weirman Wright wrote a note to Devereaux saying that after Lincoln visited, the men wanted to honor him by purchasing a big flag. So the men shipped in their salary to buy a 40 foot flag and Wright paid for the flagpole. So don't know if they ever got the flagpole up, but since I had a description of their intent to do it, I put it up on uh, Aquila Atlantic. So that is a scale. 40-foot flag. Uh, here's an overview of the work in progress. Uh, you can see a lot of detailing still left to be done. Although the car ferry is done and the car ferry is operational, we don't move the car ferry during op sessions, but you can load it, unload it during op session. 
And one of the things I found with ship models is the simplest way to build a ship model for your railroad is to just paint it on the backdrop. And so that right there and that one there, those took one night each to put on the backdrop. And uh, it's taken me over 10 years to build that paddle wheeler. So that is a very good ratio. <laughs> And uh, I didn't mention the, there's a famous anecdote about a missing whiskey barrel on the Virginia Central. And so we have a little cartoon. And what this cartoon is showing is the figures that you can do in O-scale, okay? I like figure modeling and O-scale figures are just big enough that they look pretty good. They're not great. 132nd figures can be extremely lifelike. Uh, these O-scale figures are pretty good. And so that is one of the main reasons I did it in O-scale. Now, in terms of operations, I've talked about this a little bit. I did find a copy of the schedule of my railroad down at the uh, archives, but I had to move it up a year because I found the 64 schedule, which only ran for nine days. And I jazzed it up a little bit so that I could have two crews running at one time. And so that's what this schedule reflects, although graphically it looks exactly like the schedule they had, including those comments down below. And here are some, uh, some pictures from op sessions at my house. I've had 22 official op sessions on the road before COVID hit. I've also had a lot of open houses and um, many op sessions for kids and things. One of the, my favorite was when the local neighborhood children, uh, their parents got together and we ran them in three different groups through the layout in one day. So we had a, a scavenger hunt set up for them and they got to operate. So while kids were not driving trains, they were doing the scavenger hunt. So you see the girls with the clipboards, they're doing the scavenger hunt. And then this is, uh, she's like six years old, I believe in this picture, she's drawing a train. These kids did great, they didn't derail one train, they didn't have one wreck the whole day. It was really a lot of fun. That's better than I can say for most of my operators. Uh, and here we see uh, Bill Darnby, who's a pretty well-known operator, extremely excited as he backs a train up onto a quiet landing. You can tell that Bill is a very excitable kind of guy. So for the future, well, here's what I'm planning. I've got to finish quiet landing. I need at least 10 more freight cars, maybe a few more. Uh, I want to get the operations going with the telegraph. One of these days, I think it'd be fun if we just all wore period costume. I don't know how we're going to do that. I have my general's costume that I can wear. Um, many details I need to add. I want to try making my own figures. I show you the loco I'm scratch building, and I'm also expanding my railroad. So no, that doesn't mean I'm adding an Air Force to the railroad. The story to this picture is a couple of years ago, um, George Wallace from the O-Scale Kings, not the former governor of uh, Alabama, he visited my railroad and we were chatting, and he told me that he was an F-105 pilot in Vietnam. And I said to him, oh, that was one of my favorite airplanes as a kid, the old Coke bottle shape, uh, although they had the highest loss rate of, of any airplane ever served in the US military, more than half of them were shot down. So anyway, after he left, I jigged up this little Photoshop picture and I sent it to him. And he said to me, oh, that's cool. How did you know my squadron? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, that yellow ring is my squadron. Apparently the color on the ring of the nose designated the squadron. And it was just luck. I didn't know that was his squadron. Anyway, so that's the origin of that picture. Uh, back in 2019, I had a flood. I had a couple floods in my basement. And uh, this is the Great Johnson flood. My basement, it felt like that, even though it wasn't as bad. Um, and that's what the railroad looked like as we recovered from the most serious of the floods. So we all decided, the insurance company and everybody, that we had to redo the floor. The floor used to be vinyl planking that I installed by myself. But... Now we have ceramic tile that I had to have guys do for me. It was like 4,000 pounds of tile. And at the point, my arthritic hip was really bad. I couldn't carry tile up and down the stairs. So I had a crew do it. You can see them working over here. They actually jacked up the railroad, took the old floor out, put the tile in, and then we shimmed the railroad back. And it did get a little bit of damage on the railroad, but not much. And so after a couple of weeks of work, that is what the crew lounge where my old port of Los Angeles used to be looked like. And so there's a hole in the wall for the eventual expansion. That was the staging for the old port of Los Angeles HO layout, which by the way, 
Uh, I sold to Tom Pierpoint, and then he bought the layout, was going to set it up in Burke, Virginia, but then moved to Texas and took the layout with him. So that's where the, the Pola is now. And so I looked at some ideas for expansion. So this would be a potential, if I were to backdate my railroad to 62, when they did go to Fredericksburg, and that's what that could look like. But my real, my two requirements were I wanted to be able to run the 10 car train like originally planned. So that means I need longer sidings at Falmouth. And I really wanted a larger minimum radius, particularly at that turn back curve uh, at Falmouth where I was having trouble. And so I looked at a lot of different ideas. This one, um, I would get rid of the crew lounge and just have this big peninsula in there and I would reconfigure quiet landing. So I would lose Burnside Wharf and I did not put the loop in the closet, which I eventually did do, and I lost my crew lounge. So I didn't go with that one. I considered this plan, which is I would expand the quiet landing, get rid of the wharf down here, and I would just lose Burnside Wharf, but I would get all the stations on the line. So I have Quaya, I have Brook, whoops, go back. Can I go back? Yeah, I would have a Quaya and Brook up here, Toma Creek, and then this would have been Stoneman's and then Falmouth there. So that was, had some potential. I also looked at a little less elaborate plan where I would have just the loop in the closet come into Falmouth down here. So I really wouldn't change anything up here. Only thing I had to do was change that. And I left the quiet landing alone. So if those of you who remember back about 20 years ago, I did this thing called decision matrix. So I took out that same matrix and I looked at the factors that would be different. So all the other factors that were the same, I just took off the chart. These were the ones that would be different. So manageable, uh, wide aisles, maximum main line, have the big bridge, the waterfront area, have a crew lounge, and then did my scoring uh, total, just a mathematic score, and then weighted by their averages. And we can see that plan A is a winner in both cases. Also note that none of them are, they're not, none of them have non-acceptable scores and really only plan B was a war, marginal waterfront. I guess I lose Burnside Wharf. So that's what I ended up with. I did do uh, an expansion through the closet and because of the way the closet is with this low stair over here, I actually prefabricated this piece in the garage using little wedges. So that way I was able to make my piece of plywood all straight cuts, cut them on my chop saw, join them with dominoes so they're very sturdy. And all this bench work was prefabricated as little wedges or a road bed, I should say, not bench work. And so that's what it looks like right before I put the scenery on it. Uh, so you can see the prefabricated wedges and there's a straight section and it ties into the other side of the railroad. The section that's in the underneath the stair I actually prefabricated this in the garage. So there's the straight piece that goes under the stairs. This is a touch screen, I gotta be careful. Uh, there's a straight section and then, so I got that running smoothly in the garage and then I installed the whole thing underneath the stairs in one shot. So I didn't have to worry about kinks or anything like that underneath the stairs and it running very reliably. I also lined these wedges with pieces of masonite. So if something does come off, they don't fall on the floor. And so here's how it connects into the existing railroad. So if you look real close right here, that's where the old railroad stopped and the new expansion starts. So hopefully if I did my job right, you can't tell. I was able to realize this piece of scenery back here, but all the rest of this had to be redone. Uh, remember I mentioned that there were union families that stayed behind? Well, at Leyland Station, there was, oh, sorry, my leg's cramping. There was a trimmer family and he was pro-union and his son actually served in the Union Army. So when the army camped out there, they used his house as a headquarters for a division, two different divisions camped out there. And uh, he kept track of all the stuff that they used of his, woods, uh, they chopped down some apple trees, they ate so many of his pigs and things. And after the war was over, he applied for and got like a 2,000 some dollars reimbursement for the damages done to his property. The reason he got that money was because he was pro-union. Southern families that were not pro-union were not eligible to get reimbursed for damages that the Union Army caused. So 
and vice versa. The South never reimbursed the Northern families for their damage. So it's kind of an interesting side effect. But I do have one picture of this guy's house. And so I was able to put it on the turnback curve, which is now a full 33 inch radius as opposed to the 28 I had before. And uh, the nice thing about O scale are the buildings themselves are view blocks. So you can hardly see the tracks back there. You can just barely see one there and a little bit there. So it helps hide the train going around the sharp curve. And then here you see a train going by the, these are cattle that are being stored by the union for uh, their own use. And I put a picture of this online and somebody wrote to me and said, you know, cattle back then had horns. Hornless cattle really weren't uh, breed or bred in the United States until like the 19th, 20th century. So I had to go back and put horns on all my cattle. So now I have horny cattle. And then here we come across this a nice S curve up there. Um, we call him John Dry it was over and I, I ended up calling this curve after him, I'm calling it Dry's curve. And here we see the, the new tunnel that goes through the closet. And there's a little guy up here. What's he doing up there? Well, if you read Telegraph in the White House by Homer Bates, who was a telegraph operator for Lincoln, they talk about how one time there was a spy on the Aquia line who was tapping the telegraph. Now the union operated with a code, so he couldn't really decipher what they were saying. And furthermore, they could tell when he tapped on because the tones that came over the wire were different. So he changed impedance or whatever of the system and they could tell. And so they would actually send messages to him saying, hey, go home, you know, we're coming looking for you. They never did find the guy. However, they did find silk wires in a pile by one of the telegraph poles. So they think they, have, they may have found out where he was operating. So anyway, he might be my spy up there. Now, I haven't finished the section in the crew lounge. I just have the bench work and about 10%, 20% of the track. I have all the ties down and um, it's just time to start spiking. So this is an artist concept of what the trestle is gonna look like as you come out of the tunnel. This is a low trestle. I'm calling it Mueller's Creek. One of the fellows in our Civil War Railroad group passed away last year from cancer. And then tragically his wife died in a fall down the stairs at a church. So I'm gonna name the creek after them. And uh, that's about where I am. I do have a book out. This book is still for sale if you wanna learn more. And I did some other books. The, the yellow book, the 45 track plans is now out of print. I don't even think I, I think I have one left. And uh, my latest book is on the waterfront terminals, steel mill book, and some track planning books. And if you want to figure out more about what I'm doing, you can go to my blog, or you can go to my Alchem Scale Models website and buy some of the stuff that I sell. And that's my Scratchville passenger car with the interior that I showed you earlier. And we never did find that whiskey barrel. You know, with these soldiers, it's uh, long gone. By the way, does anybody know what these things are back here? You see my mouse? Anybody have any idea? I'll tell you at the end. I do want to acknowledge the help that I've had on my railroad. Um, those people in sort of no real order, sort of alphabetical order. Um, plus I've had many operators and others that help. Plus my wife and my late mother uh, we're very supportive in this room. I have to thank them too. And so one other thing is, uh, Andy mentioned that earlier, we had to cancel 2021 because of COVID again. Hopefully we'll be able to do that in Baltimore again in 2022. And so that's my talk. Uh, I guess I'll take questions if anybody's got any. I have two. You said about using the Form 32. Did they, they have any Form 19s used back then or just 32s? Well, they weren't actually a 32 form. That 32 was a telegraph code to indicate that I have understood the following. So what I think that is, it's a readback. So the when the operator wrote it back, he would telegraph back. I think this is how they did it. Um, I've asked several operators about that and that's what they, they think. But your other part of your question is no. That Form 19s did not exist at this time. You did not have a clearance or anything like that. Very, like I said, there were only five pages in the rule book. Okay. Oh, Bernie, back, back, back in your era of the wharf, why were the car floats 
the car the tracks placed horizontal as opposed to what we see today being vertical or longitudinal yeah uh, the reason for that is they took two existing barges from the Shuko River they call Shuko barges and they lashed them together and so I guess because of stability purposes they put them that way so that the thing wouldn't tip but later they figure out hey this is easier if we just have two tracks Okay. But, you know, they this just they used existing stuff to do it quickly. Okay. They had uh, two. They had two Uzis, and they had another one that had three cars lashed together, or three uh, floats lashed together. Okay. Thank you. Uh, before you started your presentation, you mentioned there was a very friendly Civil War website. What was that? Oh uh, well, no, the guy John Ott. You mean him? Google, uh, you can go to my go to my blog, which is US Military Rare, USMRR.blogspot.com. Right. And click, click on John Ott's. I have a link to his website on my layout. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Bernie, I have another question uh, for you. You yeah. showed a picture of City Point and it showed a locomotive, some type of stock car, and a passenger car on the left side of the photograph. Have you been able to identify exactly what that stock car is used for? Because I have a very similar uh, situation on this Denver South Point Pacific that I assumed was a horse car that would carry a riding animal and not, you know, a cattle, which would take a heavier car. Yeah, they they uh, stock cars were available during the Civil War. However, the U.S. Military Railroad didn't have any. That particular car causes a lot of people. Uh, wondering what's going on because they basically took a flat car and put the, you know, fence around it. And uh, we don't know what they hauled on it. Probably livestock, but we don't know. Okay, because the car is, is fairly lightly built. And yeah. would not carry any heavy li livestock like cattle, which would yeah. require much more bracing. And yet a passenger car follows it. And the only conclusion I come to in the South Park is it was carrying riding horses. You're probably right. I think you might be right. So, you know, the, the, the 19th century version of the auto train. Exactly. Yeah, those officers were in the back and that was their horses in the front. However, a lot of times, at least that's like on the Aquila line, if you wanted to take the train, you could just walk to Aquila landing. Um, I've read some memoirs where guys did that. Uh, one time a guy took the train out, but then he walked back and he almost froze to death because he couldn't get to his camp in time and it was really cold. So a lot of crazy stuff happened back then. Oops. Please send a piece of photo. What is that? Is that from Alex? Is that a question or a comment, Alex? It's a, it's a reminder to everyone for the next issue of the flyer. We're looking for photos of your favorite piece of rolling stock. Oh, okay. So, All right. Well, any other questions? By the way, if you guys do want to come visit my railroad, just let me know. I live down by Del Rey, and um, I'm happy to entertain visitors. I have been vaccinated. My wife has been vaccinated. Uh, if you've been vaccinated, then come on, just stop by sometime. I'm retired now, so I'm home a lot. Ernie? Yeah, again, thank you for your program today. You're welcome. I seem to recall there was a monitor on your layout at one time. It's still there. Um, it's actually the Passaic, which was the next one they built after the um, monitor. And it got to Yorktown area in January. It broke down and they towed it to the Washington Navy Yard and they fixed it. And then it came right by a quiet landing. So it would conceivably could have been there. And Herman Hopp himself was very interested in ironclads. In fact, one of the reasons he got kicked out of the military was he wrote a letter to the Secretary of the Navy. Okay, so get this straight now. Army officer writes a letter to the Secretary of the Navy who does not, he recommends that they do a certain thing with the artillery on these guns. He didn't like the 11 inch guns. He wanted the small, or correction, 15 inch guns. He wanted smaller guns on ironclads. They ignored him, so he sent the letter to the newspapers. So that was kind of the last straw when he sort of antagonized the Secretary of War and the Secretary of the Navy. Then the political pressures came, they forced him to resign. But anyway, he was interested in ironclad. So that's why the ironclad is visiting my railroad, although technically in March, it shouldn't be there. 
it was there. It was in that picture. Um, let's see. I can show you the picture if you want to see it. It's not complete. I have all the parts for it, but I'm just not really much of a ship modeler. It takes me a long time to build a ship. Let's see, where was that picture? There it is. Uh, share, screen, share screen there. Oh, wait a minute, hit this button. Hmm, I don't see anything. It was on Bernie, he just turned it off. <laughs> there yeah, it is. what did I just do? That's not it. All these newfangled computers. All right, there it is. Guys, see that? Yeah, we can see it. You just need to. There you go. So there's the. Uh, that's where it is right now. And um, I'll show you something if you're curious. Uh, it's sitting right out there. You know, it was fun building this because I had to build, uh, can you guys see the turret? It's um, on your camera, but it's not on, the, on when you're projecting. You're still projecting your PowerPoint. There you go. So there's the turret, and there's some pretty good documentation about what this looked like. But I really wanted to do this part, which was the guns. Mm. Um, and so these are, these are all scratch built. I actually made these little cannons on my lathe. Uh, they're wood at the time. Now I would 3D print them. Um, so this was the fun part of the model, and then the rest of it, the handrails and all the other stuff, I just sort of, eh, I'll do it later, and I never finished it. But the, this part came out pretty good. What's interesting is this turned on the flat deck, so when it went out into the ocean, this thing got jacked and screwed down, and then they actually caulked it all around the edge. So if the thing was in a storm, the only way out was to crawl through this hatch right here. That's why when these things sink, so many men drown. It takes a really hard to evacuate. Yeah. Anything else? There's a great book called, uh, this, the guy was, the author was Alba Hunter, and I can't remember exactly the title, but you can get it online for free. And it talks about his time serving as a cabin boy on the sister ship of this, which was a Weehawken. And they were involved in the battle where they sunk the Confederate ironclad Atlanta, or captured it really. And uh, amazing book. Hi, you got to read. There are two books from the Civil War I highly recommend. That one and Leander Stilwell's memoirs, because these were just average schmoes in the Civil War. One was a cabin boy, one was a little uh, corporal or private. But they were great writers, and they had unbelievable experiences. And they don't brag. They're just very matter of fact about the whole thing. Great books. Good. Thank you. Anything else? Well, Bernie, I'd like to thank you on the part of the division for putting on a presentation here, an excellent presentation, excellent modeling, really, uh, really beautiful work. Uh, and for the members, just to bring to your attention, the next two events for the division will be uh, September 18th. There's a hobby barn clinic uh, being put on by uh, Nick Cullis on uh, Design Secrets. And you can contact uh, Jerry Stanley or a paymaster if you're interested in that clinic. That's to be held at his hobby barn. And September 19th, we'll have uh, Going Beyond uh, Prototype Freight Cars by Jack Burgess, uh, which will be a virtual clinic on Zoom. Uh, you'll see that coming out uh, in an email probably in a couple of weeks here. So, hey, Martin, do you have anything you want to add? Always like to give the superintendent a chance to say something. Is he up there? I'm here and I have nothing further to say. You've got it covered. Martin, when are you going to come visit? When I get some free time. You know, this retirement thing is not uh, easy. Yeah, I know the feeling. It's kind of, it's kind of scary. <laughs>